Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm C. Meyer. I'm the exhibitions manager here at Blue Sky in Portland, and I'm really thrilled to have Frank Francis here. Um, Frank had just just had an opening. Was that two weeks ago already? It's I think yeah, it's going by so fast. I have gone by so fast, and um, I unfortunately was uh, out sick during that time. But I'm that's why I'm just I'm really excited to have this conversation, be able to. Um, chat with you virtually um, and it's also a thrill to have invited Chris Graves here for a conversation together um, and welcome everyone as you've been coming in. Uh, if anyone has any questions about Blue Sky for this is your first time joining us, um, welcome. We try to do these virtual chats uh, as much as we can with our artists who aren't able to come or, or just the timing works out that um, they aren't able to do an in-person talk here at the gallery. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, check out our website uh, for more information about our upcoming events and upcoming openings. And if you're interested in membership, um, you can also check out our membership page as well. Um, so I'm just going to do some quick intros. So Frank Francis, your show, Remember the South, just opened March 2nd, and it is uh, up until April 1st. So if you're local or in the area and come down to Portland and check the show out. It's really freaking cool. We did some amazing installation for this work that I'm like, I'm just, I'm, I'm so excited about having like utilized our walls and I'll show you all pictures. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, do our land acknowledgement statement to begin with. Uh, so we at Blue Sky humbly acknowledge that our programming is being held on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Cathalmet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. In this online format, you may be participating from other areas, and we invite you to consider your own land acknowledgement that reflects your location. We also acknowledge that the very technology we rely on for these online programs is inequitably distributed and not equally accessible, creating new virtual displacements and exclusions. We call attention to the need for action now and in the future to address these disparities. So welcome, Frank. Um, so happy to have you here. Um, Frank Francis is a Greenpoint, Brooklyn-based artist, home and still life photographer with an MFA in art practice from the School of Visual Arts. His work challenges the everyday perceptions of memories and prejudice with close studies of photography's materiality and dynamics. He's no stranger to being both voyeur and subject. He once embarked on a venture across the United States, driving and living out of an 18-wheeler for over a year to create the series Hurry Up and Wait that highlights the journey of American truckers for former duo Tribble and Mancinito. He has shown in solo and group exhibitions domestically and internationally at Sasha Wolf Gallery, the Studio Museum of Harlem, Glass House, Carriage Trade, and Workstadt Graz. His work has been reviewed and featured in several publications such as the New York Times, The New Yorker, Vice, NPR, Art Info, Bomb Blog, and Bloomberg Business Week. And we are also uh, welcoming Chris Graves on the conversation tonight. Chris Graves is an artist and publisher based in New York and California. Graves creates artwork that deals with societal problems and aims to use art as a means to inform people about cultural issues. Using a mix of conceptual and documentary practices, Graves photographs the subtleties of societal power and its impact on the built environment. He explores how capitalism and power have shaped countries and how that can be seen and experienced in everyday life. Graves also works to elevate the representation of people of color in the fine art canon and to create opportunities for conversation about race, representation, and urban life. He photographs to preserve memory. Graves received his BFA in visual arts from SUNY Purchase College and has been published and exhibited globally, including Museum of Modern Art, New York, Getty Institute, Los Angeles, and National Portrait Gallery in London, England, among many others. And Graves also sits on the board of our very own Blue Sky Gallery um, and also the Architectural League of New York as Vice President of Photography. So thank you both. Uh, Frank and Chris for being here. And here's um, just a couple of the install shots. Um, this this back wall here is really the kind of <laughs> the showstopper that was super exciting. Uh, it's a big thing that we did for install. Um, and I hope like, I'm excited to do more of this kind of installation. So thanks, Frank, for being like, 
the artists to kind of push the boundaries of using our walls in a creative way. So um, yeah, and definitely if you're local, come by and check out the show um, again until April 2nd. So uh, with further ado, I will stop my share and send it on over to Frank and Chris. Awesome. You guys, thank everyone for coming out tonight and uh, hanging out with us for a few minutes. I don't know if you guys can see that. Hold on. You see my screen, right? Yes. Perfect. Here we go. Um, screen mode. Before you, before you start, did you, you made those exhibition shots? It seems like photography that you make. N not the ones that C just showed. Yu Yang, he, he produced those, but I have my own separate ones because I needed some daylight in it and I wanted to mix in a bit of everything. So, <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Well, you those are good. I like the placement of those uh, those seats. That was cool. Anyway, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but thank you, Chris, for taking a moment to you know sort of hang out and chat with the work and the show. Um, honestly, has been really fun. But I wanted to start the whole conversation with this is this is a my old childhood home in South Carolina which I think for me, is, you know, I always think of sort of home. I think about this place. This is home for me is this. And sort of like, remember the South to me starts here, right? And I've never really shown this image before. I shot it maybe over seven years ago and I just processed the negatives, four or five negatives about a month ago. <laughs> it's just been in my fridge for a long time and sort of wanted to get this show sort of up and hung to really reflect on what this place sort of meant. So this was a great starting point for the conversation. And um, just my idea of what the South sort of is for me is sort of like, this is, you know, the mothership. And then this is the initial work from the body of work. I mean, we can all, if you're an American, you know, you know, the Confederate flag and I used cotton as sort of a staple from sort of slavery to create something that felt a little more impactful, but also through photography. How do I, you know, create a language around my own sort of personal biases from growing up, but then how would I, you know, retransform them in the story of Remember the South, which Remember the South, I started shooting it in 2018, which my son Marley was born in 2016. And the main thing I needed to do was to sort of have something cathartic so that I don't really push my own beliefs and biases onto him. So this book was sort of a way for me to work through a lot of sort of ideas from growing up in South Carolina, sort of racist tropes, Confederate flag, but also celebrating soul food, which, you know, slaves use all kinds of food to just make different cuisines and elevated the food, you know, and I think also it's the backbone of American food in, in general now and so for me i wanted to take some elements and create my own sort of still life moments um i only i still see the trailer you stay <laughs> you still see the trailer yeah do you get no nope. do you see resume share here we go i saw your mouse move but i still see this tra the trailer yeah okay, we haven't moved on to the, to the second slide we're still on the first slide okay let me try this guy again you know, we never saw a screen uh, like a, yeah, we were only seeing inside the program. We weren't seeing anything that you were showing except for that trailer. That looks better. Yeah, that's going to work now. No, it's going to work. Okay. Yeah. There now. we go. Is that working? Look at that. Yeah. Woo, technology. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, there we go. So this flag of cotton and my language around my work will be very sort of chill because I think that for me, speaking about the work is more trying to be more personable and tangible to our own human experience. And to me, like my experience of sort of experiencing bias, I don't think is any different from other people. It's just I have the tool to be able to like chat about it and hopefully other people can relate to it. And um, and this is sort of like, again, a beginning point for the conversation. And Chris, you and I, you know, we speak about this stuff all the time. So I think there's a bit of nuance that you and I can speak to but mm -hmm. I think you know when we made the book because Chris also helped you know made the book through monolith editions do you have one should I, should oh, I get of course <laughs> um
Oh, yes. We made this book uh, during COVID. I started a book company named Monolith um, uh, Monolith Editions after like kind of the George Floyd protest started going. And I think, you know, we made this book with Frank first. This is our first book for that company. So yeah, we love it. I don't know if there's more. more. You have to, I don't know if there's any in the gallery. We have um, a couple copies still. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. It's beautiful. I love it. It's like the perfect size. It's big. Freaking big. <laughs> oh, you know what it is, though? Now? I'm oh, sorry. It's the exact same size as my new book, Frank. Mine is just is it? It's like the exact same size. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Crazy. You didn't, you didn't know that already? I mean... No, I never know the sizes. I mean, you can only use so many sizes if you want to max out. Okay. Like, Frank made the inside, like, the actual printed cover for my book. I don't even think Frank has seen this on a on the book yet, but... I've never think This is like some a, more new things happening tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway. So, yeah. And then this image here is of... I call it strange fruit. And it's watermelon and sort of squash made in a way that I make still lifes. And, you know, for me, speaking about watermelon... For me, it goes back to even having and hearing biases from my own family saying like, you know, for me, you know, not to eat watermelon or chicken in front of white people. So, so, so those are sort of things that like I grew up with that I uh, had to still really what work. About huh? What about now though? Do you now? Oh, now I eat anything, but I'm just saying like, I had to get over that sort of like, you know, these things that I sort of learned and now I'm unlearning them through this book. So again, like this book is a cathartic exercise through and through for me culturally and sort of like artistically how do I now adjust my whole mindset so like that's why this image was made because I was like dude what what are one of the you know ways that growing up was a bit sort of awkward because I was always like why the fuck is that a rule <laughs> wow. you know I was like I was like, that doesn't make sense to me. So like- You mean like the don't eat watermelon in front of like uh, white people rule? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, and, and for me, like I'm being candid, but it's, it's true. And I think that, you know- I don't do it. I still don't do it. Oh, see? So, so there, so you, <laughs> and I mean, what do you think about that? Well, for me, it's like, I'm just never going to do it. I mean, I'm going to go through my whole life with that like trauma. For sure. Yeah. Fried chicken? I mean, oof, I don't think so, dude. I'll eat breaded chicken in front of white people. <laughs> anyway. But but again, but it's, it's, it's beyond more than that. So I think that like, again, certain ways, this is an installation shot with just a body in, in context of the pieces. But I think, you know, for me, the idea of what the work is and what my personal practice is, is always trying to readjust my own experiences through life. And most notably, how I started out in life, right? Like, I think the beginning has such a big influence on how I see the world now. And also just my optimism for how I can have my own personal evolution. And I think, you know, making work, creating books is that sort of checking point of where I think I'm evolving, you know, I think uh, creatively, spiritually, um, and hopefully it is a way to become more, I think, secure. And, you know, my own being, I think, you know, making work has always been that sort of safe space, mm -hmm. you know, um, and this work, can you see the blue image on the screen, guys? Can you see it? Okay. And so this is work I call space aid. And space aid is essentially just Kool-Aid. So growing up, for me, you know, for my family and I, you know, we would drink Kool-Aid, which is, you know, packets of basically dye. And then we add a bunch of sugar to it. So, so it would be like a pitcher of water, a little bit of food dye, mad sugar. <laughs> and so, you know, I think, you know, it also speaks to like diabetes in this country, diabetes in my, in my culture, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, I also had to think about Kool-Aid as a tool, like a spaceship. So to me, I, you know, I begin to see these elements that I grew up with as sort of like, how do I go to space and back? And so the space aid made me realize, like, how do I create things that feel like space for 25 cents? Because that's what it costs, at least back then, to buy Kool-Aid packets. And you could just buy, you know, 10 for like a dollar, depending on what day of the week it is at the grocery store. My local Piggly, you know, Piggly Wiggly was the grocery mm -hmm. store. 
Do you have a favorite uh, a favorite Kool Aid color? Or yeah, because color, I guess. It's, no, no, no. You're right. It's, it's the color, the grape. Obviously, you know, it's purple. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't photograph very well, so I haven't gotten to photographing purple yet. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have to put that. Are you? How are you photographing these? I, I I don't really disclose that, but okay, cool, cool. Okay. Can, <laughs> but, if, I, I, if I just said one word, would you say yes or no? I was thinking like light box. No. Awesome. Great. <laughs> so that's how you do the purple. Sure. <laughs> Go on. But but yeah, so again, space age. So like really pushing the boundaries of what the elements I can take. And sort of keep pushing it. So this is the first space aid example, and then I do cutouts. So like during COVID, when Ahmad Arbery was murdered, Marley and I we were just working on sort of like these construction paper things for kids. Wow. We were just playing around, and my son Marley, he was three years old at the time, and I think you know I saw Ahmad Arbery come on the screen, and I got, I just broke down into tears, and so I just started making these different things. This is you know bullet holes whips and then a shirt tank top you know so i think you know again just this is pretty straightforward hitting people over the head with like you know also just the dead body tape is isn't also in reference to that phenomenon if you look at sort of you know black on black crime things like that in our country um i'm gonna keep i want to get back to more of the cutouts but i want to move on from here for a second if you have any questions, hold them. <laughs> and then this is another space aid. I think probably to date, one of my, I think top three space aids that I fully transform space, you know, and time with Kool Aid. Um, and then this is using cotton as sort of like the Mandingo, you know, black exploitation. Like it's poking sort of fun at ideas of sort of, you know, black, you know, things. <laughs> yeah, black um, sexual exploitation. Yes, thank you. Um, trying not to be crude here, in case there's kids on. I just saw a kid. Yeah. So, and then, oh, yeah. and then now this is, a, this is something I made in 2022. Again, ex, you know, expanding the language of Remember the South with, added elements of like the African mask. I'm trying to find old taxidermy, you know, items that like I think may exist in and around the plantation perhaps. So like I'm using my own imagination, but beyond that I shoot in homes. I shoot with a lot of like still life components. I worked for nine years at One Kings Lane and we had a prop house and in the prop house that would be these African masks or cotton or other elements where they would be like, hey, let's make the shot ethnic. And I'm like, what? Hmm. You know, so like, so they would say, make it ethnic and then add cotton to it. I'm like, come on, guys, we gotta do better than that. <laughs> so, so I started taking these elements from the prop house and then sort of rearranging them in ways that I thought would be more, I think, potent to, again, represent my own biases, my own sort of hangups, my own racism in, in some way. And I think I had to really, again, continue to make the work so I can dispel every aspect of those biases. Um, but the African masses will be a theme throughout, I think, the rest of my life and work because I think it's so important in art history from Picasso to whomever else you want to, you know, you want to name in between that. Um, and I think mining that field is really important. And so to go back to the conversation of speaking with my three-year-old son Marley about Amar Arbery, like this is the image that I made to explain to Marley. You know, I was like, you know, I felt like Black people in this country are being hunted. And even when hearing about George Floyd, it's like it's continually being hunted year over year in some way. And this was the piece I made to sort of like each stripe. I will put down a stripe. I put down the Black figure. And then the last piece will be the blue stripe to represent the American flag and sort of how complicated our own personal histories are. And I'm, you know, and I didn't know at the time of making this, like the, the history of Oregon is wild and which I didn't know that until actually hanging in the show. So I, that's why I think I made the work in certain ways be smaller for your space. So people have to go and confront what's actually there. 
you know, and then the space aid image was really important to be that big on the wall so that people had to walk into it and to confront it, you know, and then the larger American flag there, which I call Africa. And this is the largest piece on the wall. Obviously printing with vinyl, you lose a bit of color, but this is the true color format of the large piece in the wall. I think it's seven by 11 feet, I think. It's awesome, it's huge. Um, here's an example of it. And again, the images are slightly different from the gallery images because I wanted to be really minimal. I mean, I, you know, I see myself as a minimalist, as a creator. Um, so I needed things to be a, away from it so it can breathe a bit. Are, is, are all of the large pieces in the show vinyl or? Like yes, yes. And, and thanks to C for giving me that idea. I've never worked with vinyl. And, you know, it sort of reminded me in, in a way, my old grad school teacher, Gary Simmons, he'll be like, yo, just make it big. You know, like, and I'm like, for what? And he'll be like, you'll know when you make it big. You know, he was like, you, you'll come to understand what the work actually means. And when the show came up and C showed me the specs, I was like, how do I scale this to be right? And I, you know, for, I think we had this show planned for two years. I made paintings. I made all kinds of things to see how could I scale it properly. And then C was like, no, we just do vinyls. And I'm like, oh man, here's a great idea of how to expand something that I couldn't have seen for myself. So I think, you know, I really appreciate that. Adding it to the tool bag now, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, yeah, it's, it looks really good. Clean. And Thanks it's, it's, to the installers, whoever they are. They're already on. <laughs> Yang, and thank you guys. I mean, really amazing work. I mean, yeah. And the printer as well. Amazing work. And then this is, I call it good hair. Because, I mean, you know, I, we've all seen documentaries about the, the black hair. And for a long time when I had hair, more hair than this, you know, I would use a, a brush <laughs> to brush it. And, um, but again, I wanted to take cotton, the African mask, and to create a still life. And this brush that's here, I think I've had since I was 10. I still have it. And it's, you know, it's just a very old brush, but I feel like it was very important to shoot for this particular time. And now you know what a brush is. I mean, <laughs> I think I've lost it. <laughs> it's just, man, I wish I had a hairline to use a brush with. Yeah. <laughs> RIP to the hairline. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad. I lost it so long ago that I don't even remember it anymore. Okay. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and this is just speaking about the passage and sort of the Klansmen, but also poking poking fun at it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, at least in the South, and which recently I remember being in the South and seeing artifacts from new Klansmen, and I thought it was very interesting that in the 2000s that we still have this problem to deal with in some way. But, you know, this is my rendition of it. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, is an image that, like, I really pulled from the prop house and was like, what are these elements in the prop house? So I think, again, trying to think outside of the commercial aspect, because I make a living commercially, but everything I do, everything I make, I think can be taken out of whatever context and put into a museum or gallery wall to show. And which in this particular case, I took some cotton from the, you know, let's make it ethnic shot. I took a black hand from, you know, the little still life component on the shelf and just started using the elements, some velvet, things that I felt like, again, items that I think that would be found around on a plantation. And and particularly in the big house, because I don't think that, you know, a lush velvet would be in a slave part, in the slave quarters. So for me, like, I am trying to step back into history. I also don't think that things that I remember are fully mine. I think they may be in my DNA at some point of what I remember, what I don't remember, or what I misremember, things like that. Um, generational trauma. I think I also make work from those places. Um, yeah. There's another example of the show. And I wanted to show the split here of sort of the larger work and the smaller work so you can see the context 
if you didn't see the show in person, you can see the context of the smaller prints versus the larger prints. How how smaller? How what's the size of the smaller prints? Those are roughly eleven by fourteen, mm -hmm. but the printer he he left them at the you know native size of the negative mm -hmm. for the most part, which is nice. So they're all slightly different. Gotcha. And this is the real image of it with the true color. Love it. And yeah, and then here's another space aid, which I thought again, thinking about the galaxy and escaping. Definitely escaping. Everything I do is about escaping. <laughs> it's about escaping, but also being in some realism, right? Like some suspended realism. But I think that's what we all do, like as artists, right? Like we try to create our own realism in some mm -hmm. way. Um, but this is my last slide for this. I have something after this, but I wanted to see if there's any questions here before we go further, because it's only like two more images, but the two more images will take up a lot of talking points, I think. Uh, well, okay, let's see. Uh, well, I, I would ask a question if no one else has a question. Is there, can everybody answer questions? Like, are people have voices? I mean, meaning like, can you, un can people unmute themselves is a real question. Um, I can unmute people uh, or I can just read the questions in the chat. I mean, we have one question already um, from Julia Dolan. I'm happy to read yeah. that out loud and you guys, yeah, does that sound good? Cool. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So Julia Dolan um, says, hi, Frank. Thanks so much for your generosity this evening. The installation looks great, and I was definitely impacted by the scale shift. I'm curious about the relationship between the mural size of vinyl images and the much smaller photos. Did you print smaller in order to emphasize the scale of the murals, or do you normally print at that size? I printed those small so that you have to walk away from the larger works to go see the smaller works. And for me, I, I print things in space the way that I think the space will engulf a piece of work to make you go see it closer. Um, again, I'm a minimalist at heart, and I want to make sure that the space is also considered along with the pieces. So to be a true sort of like, you know, non-believer in, in sizes, I, you know, I print whatever size I think is important for the space. And thank you for the question. Thanks, Frank. I thought it was, yeah, that was interesting when you were talking about the sizing about um, and what you learned here at Oregon and using the word confrontation, I think is really, I like how you have that like sense of confrontation either between the small or the large pieces. And it's sort of that like people have to get close up and then get that by going at the small, but then you get this really big impact when you walk into the, the gallery with the larger pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think is really interesting to just be able to have that that duality of confrontation with with your choice of scale well yeah I mean I would say confrontation I know it's a harsh word but like I make work from that place although I'm outwardly happy like I'm very optimistic but inside it is this churn that I think is important for me as an engine it is the gas that keeps this thing going you know to feel like the work has to have some sort of conversation not just in, you know, with the space, but also hopefully with other artists. Because again, I don't think I'm the only one who, who's who gone through this. I think there's been other artists who make, who have, they, you know, they have a different conversation with the work as well, or with racism, which I love that. And my work is just an additive to those conversations, I think. Mm -hmm. Their work is too, I believe. Has yeah. To be. yeah. And, um, and I think, Chris, that's why I wanted to have you in the conversation, because I feel like in some ways, I've never met anyone like you who had the, the curiosity and sort of like the ability to go anywhere in the world and make whatever you want. Like with, I think, the utmost confidence and curiosity for a place and people. I think you are also like approaching a place with a sense of sort of, um, I think, emotional fortitude that I don't think I always see. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that, you know, we've been friends for a long time almost a decade and I and I didn't realize that until probably a few years ago you know 
I think we've been friends since like 2008 or nine, man. It's been a long ass time. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But yeah, I think I I just, I don't know. I think my parents like gave me the opportunity to kind of think outside the box or be a little bit free when I was young. I mean, they're, they, they encouraged me to do art or make art. So I think with that, they also were kind of artists. I mean, they they are artists um, in their own right. So Mm -hmm. they kind of allowed it and they knew that it would, could be taken away so easily, you know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, most people are not allowed to even be artists because there's no, you know, there's no money in it or there's, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. well, usually there's no money in it because most, most people (laughs) like, you know, I'm a, I'm a suburban kid pretty much. So like your, your family usually wants you to go to college to be like something. Uh, But my parents allowed me to go to college to be nothing, which was great. Yeah. (laughs) It gave me some freedom to then uh, meet people from everywhere at an art school and then go mm-hmm. visit those people and and for cheap and free. So right. that was very helpful for my development. Yeah. And, it, and I'm, look, yeah, led and, to and, more and more curiosity. And I would say uh, it's, it's for me, it's inspirational to know that too, man, because that story, again, my mom, I was raised single mom by single mom. She was always like, yo, just go do whatever you want. And I'm like, I was very lucky in that way, mm-hmm. you know? you know, while she worked her ass off to sort of like raise us, she was also like, you had to go discover the world that you want to live in, however you want to do it. And I was like, man, that that was really, that was a gift. I didn't know that at the time, but that, that was a big, that was probably the greatest gift. Uh-huh. And the first had. house that you showed, how long were you there? Well, there, so I'll go back in case people did not see that um, before I go forward. And I got, went forward by accident. <laughs> Let's go here. So yeah, so this is again my mothership, the starting point. I think my mom when she got divorced when I was like two, three. We lived here until I was seven. Mm-hmm. But we left here for you know because of another traumatic event, which has no purpose in being said here. But again, it just cemented sort of like where I wanted to go. So like for me, I was like, from this place, I had to be able to go anywhere. You know, yeah. and I was like, everything is possible. If this uh, is honestly, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. And I remember that you made a, I mean, you didn't show it, but I know that you've made a picture. You used to make these uh, more conceptual artworks when you're in grad school, mm-hmm. these houses with colored uh, plexiglass. Yeah. And I believe that it was of a White House from about the same angle, correct? Yeah. And that was the first house that Trace and I lived at upstate. Um, we lived there and that was sort of my introduction to understanding home, right? Like what is the structure and sort of like in a home, the way I make work now, even with celebrities or whatever, home is sort of wherever the emotional makeup begins and ends, but also how it thrives or shifts or augments. Everyone has their own relationship to like wherever they're from, right? And wherever they want to go, who they want to be. And I think that the work for me always is that how to how can I always inspire someone to keep shifting? So the starting point, same angle, the angle happened by coincidence, really. And if it is similar, it's because I am going back to the same place. And I'm sure it started, it stems from this. You know, I think it's a very subconscious thing that I'm like, I'm returning to this moment over and over again, which now I'll move forward to um. Alicia Keys and Swiss, like this is my commercial work to sign make a living. This is for Architectural Digest cover shoot, but meeting them in person, like, you know, like we all see great people on TV or on concerts and things like that, but to actually have a great few days to have conversations, inflections with them about their own lives, I thought was so incredible. And I feel extremely lucky to be invited into people's homes to photograph them in their spaces because for me I'm always searching for what home can be like what is the more what is home to someone else what is home to me and then how to how do I then break a home down between a still life space aid like a crack in the floor what is it going to tell the audience what is going to tell the viewer um so I see a larger and then more macro and even more macro while I shoot Mm-hmm. And this is their home, which I think is, you know, there's no other home like this. You know what I mean? And I think that 
knowing their own histories or where they came from to them going to here, I see this as sort of like a, another beginning point for me to say, okay, I don't live here, but you know what? Someone like Swiss and Alicia said that, hey, this could be yours at some point. And I'm like, for me, I think that voice can go for everyone. Wherever you want to go, you can go. Whatever doubts you have, they're going to be there, but you know, but keep going. You know what I mean? So I think that I end the I end the conversation tonight with say, to say that I think that this is sort of opulent in ways that I would never want to live. But I think that the idea that knowing the people who live in that house started out in a place like me, I think that's really important. You know, yeah. and I think that for all the kids and adults who have doubts and have dreams. And if, if you see the work that I that I make, if you hear me speak, I mean, everyone should know they can come, they can, they can get here or they can get further. You know, I think that there's so many places to go that are different. And I hope that the work that I do keeps encouraging people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in a big way. But yeah. Yeah, it is. And I think that that's, you know, that's a, that's what we want as artists to kind of make the work, get it out there and to have people actually, you know, think about it, enjoy it or, or hate it. I mean, I, I would go for either actually. <laughs> no, fair, yeah. Fair, I mean, you don't, you don't have to love the work, but you understand that, you know, there's a rigor to it. Mm -hmm. You know, like we've all seen easy work be made for whatever reason. And I think that everything I make is not easy. Even if it's a paid job is still very difficult, but they all have a thread, you know, Mm -hmm. which I think is, 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 is in search of home for me always. Well, that could be the name of your forthcoming book if there was one, right? I mean, there's, there's always a book being made in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, but that's all I got. You know, I think, thank you. Thank you, everyone from the show. I'm pretty sure there are questions, but I want to thank people before I forget. <laughs> you know? well, thank it's you not a, it's not a, yeah. It's cool. To, it's great to hear some of the history. Of the, I mean, I I didn't know a lot of the, a lot of that stuff, so it's really great to kind of go through and see it visually um, through mm -hmm. through the work. Um, how did you get into art? Like, what what was the first piece? Like, why did you choose art? How early was that? You know. So when I was about thirteen, my mom was like, "Either you can go be an artist because I see I see that you're interested." Sports, I was like skinny kid, you know, like I was like, I'm not going to do a sports thing. It wasn't something I love to do. And then I was lucky enough to apply to the to something called the South Carolina Governor School for the Arts and Humanities, in which I didn't know at the time. I was 15. I went to boarding school there. It, it completely changed my life. And I was around, you know, dancers, musicians, writers, you know, tons of other artists. It was a school of 125 people. And we had the most sort of focus and concentration on making art of all kinds, you know, from jewelry, sculpture, writing, graphic design. And I had that experience from 15 to 18 and it transformed everything about how I saw ambition, work and possibilities. Mm -hmm. And the possibilities from that day. And I mean, you know, it sounds corny, but I mean, for me, like, you know, I was like, there was it's endless, you know, possibilities from going to that school and seeing all walks of life, you know, you know, make things. And people I went to school with, you've all seen them on TV. You've all heard their music on the radio. You've all seen their music. I've seen the art in museums and you don't even know it, but there are people who went to the program that I went to and we were, to me, it was like, it's the, to me, it's the Yale version of like high school. And, you know, like Yale's grad school, this high school to me was, is that I think potent and special um, in people's lives who went there. So I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. Very lucky. Yeah. It's really great. I mean, fortunate. I mean, you also had a, you wanted, you wanted it. So, I mean, you could have went there and done nothing at all. So, you know, like most, like a lot of people let Yale after they get out. <laughs> okay. No shade. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I'll, I'll, I, can, I can do the shade. Uh, no, that we have a <laughs> Rocio, Rocio Pierce says, my nine-year-old has a comment. He thinks this piece is really cool. He's talking about space aid and that it looks like a, gal a galaxy. Mm. I wanted you to know that. So, 
Amazing. See, I, see, to me, that that's important. Like, that's all I need. That's it. The whole book's done. If one kid like can see something that I'm thinking, because I don't always know. I think that's that's amazing. That's so cool. You know. Thank you. But yeah, I want to hear questions, man. You guys have to have questions. It's like a, what is it? It's a. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Wednesday night, in in wherever you are. <laughs> And, you know, and look, if you don't want to ask questions here, you know, you can always, you know, email me because I know sometimes it's hard to ask things in, in public. You know? Yeah, feel free to jump in on the chat. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll, uh, oh, no, let's see, Brittany's got your hand raised. Let's see. I'm going to do real quick. Uh, do, 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 do. Let you all unmute yourselves. Um, so, Brittany, um, you should be able to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Faces on the screen, Frank. Thanks for showing the work. I want to yeah, see oh, yeah. faces now. So I see, I see, right, I'm going to stop sharing here then. Okay, here we go. All right. Hi, hey, guys. Hi, <laughs> great talk. Thank you. Hey, uh, Brittany. The question I had for you is actually, I was looking through, I'm listening and scrolling on your Instagram. Um, <laughs> and I was noticing like this really big difference between, you know, like the kind of work that you do commercially for a living that you were talking about and how how much like kind of sort of casual and play there is in this um, work that you're kind of showing now where there's abstractions and things that almost feel like um, collage. Can you talk about like the difference in the way that you've kind of separated out like the work that you do for a living and the work that you do with this work? Yeah, I mean, essentially, I just haven't been hired much to do my collage work commercially, but I would. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a great question because I will literally use any tool to make art. And I think the collage to me has always been a part of my life. Making work, it just hasn't been shown a lot. And, um, I, you know, Chris and I, we had a conversation the other day. I have so much work that I just don't show, but I think that my Instagram feed is a feed that, again, you can pull certain images and put them next to any image from Remember the South, and they should feel like they're from the same person. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want there to be too much of a difference. Obviously, when there's art director involved, you got to go, you know, you got to tell that line too. <laughs> but I think that's a great question in terms of my collage work, because I do think that in the future, there'll be more ways to merge the two. For sure, it's just a it's just a matter of cultural you know collateral that people let me do more of what I can do, you know. Cultural collateral, aka notoriety. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm going through history because I want to like hear like the the history of the like how you got to where you are. Um, Mm -hmm. When we, I'm when we, when we were hanging out in the city, maybe 12, 13 years ago now, this was not, were you thinking about still life? Cause at that point you were making pretty straight, like four or five work uh, yeah. on the road. Like yeah. you became a truck driver. Is that correct? Like, did you, and you got like a license to do this. Yeah. Had, had, a, had a truck driver license, but here's the thing is that while shooting four or five, I was always shooting crusts on the ground. Yeah. And Micro and versions of a world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have all that work to look back at. And I was already making this work. I just didn't realize it. And like, you know, I, obviously going to grad school, a little bit of life, kid, relationships, all these things have to, you know, I think come, they all come out, right? Like our truths come out at some point. There's no way to hide it. And I think that that's why the work now is more diverse. But back then it still existed, mm -hmm. but in a very small way. Yeah. And what do you have behind you? What is that? Is that something that you've made? Yeah. So this is um this is a painting that I make. It's of cotton, but it's in the way of a photogram. So it's like actually putting things on top, but also using the idea of like fix developer all doing its thing in these layers. So I use paint in that layered way of a photogram, but mm -hmm. in real life. But this is just like early versions of it. Haven't really expanded it to the extent I really want to. But again, cultural capital will come later. But it's there. Again, it's 23. It's been here. So in 2056, you know, 
and I do more of it. <laughs> you know, we can say it's always been there. Looks like Robert Hoffman has a question in the chat. Uh, very cool work and interesting to hear your description of your life and your work. I have a minor technical question. You mentioned film. Could you comment briefly on this digital and film medium format? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the house that you saw, I shot with, I shoot with four by five when I do shoot film and I use, I used to use Kodak 400 NC because I like the colors to be neutral. Um, that's very technical. And then from the digital standpoint, I shoot with anything from a phase one Fuji GFX or a Canon 5DS. I rotate in all these cameras because I sort of have them all at this point. And I'm sort of a, I love gear. I didn't realize I love gear. I think this might be, a, this might be an, inter an intervention. I love gear guys. Thank you. Said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. If you say it once, yeah. maybe. You yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> Great question. Gear. Man, so do you have a favorite camera to use at this point? Man, no, no. Any camera is my favorite camera. I like or it. any paintbrush is my is my favorite camera. I mean, like this canvas behind me is my favorite camera. I mean, it, anything that gets me an idea out is the camera, you know. Yeah. Cool. I mean, you know, like because I, I think about painters who are painters first and then transition to making great photographs. I don't think they would consider themselves photographers. They would consider themselves as artists. Mm -hmm. I see myself as just an art maker who yeah. happens to use photography, right? Like I think that like, if I go, if I turn left tomorrow, I might pick up, I don't know, sculpture or something. I don't know. It depends whatever the idea is. I want to just have the bandwidth to say I'm open to do it or try it. I feel that. I mean, mm -hmm. you've already worked with sculpture to make the stills. Yeah. Um, anything else? I wonder if you both can talk more about the book and like how that came to be. You know, we have a lot of people who are interested in photo books, but especially with your work, Frank, um, did you it's sort of like, did having a book, was that something that came later? Or were you already thinking about wanting to see your, this work as, in a book format? Or if you see it more as like an installation, like what you have here or... Um, mm -hmm. And also sort of paired with that, curious about how you've shown this work in the past, especially your like larger painting and collage work. And, and then how you see that translating into like a book format. And yeah, I've got I've got the copy here, too, which is. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, gallery and come peruse this um, if you're local. Um, well, I would start with books. I met with Alex Soth years ago and Alex Soth was like, I make images for books. I'll never forget that sort of conversation that we had. And I, I think I think it must have been 2007. It was while I was truck driving because I went to Minnesota to see him. And um, and he was like, books are how I make my own history. And I think from that standpoint, I just make images to then make books. And once I make my book, then I make a show to me. I think shows are secondary to anything. Obviously, I want to show them museums and galleries, but I think when I sit in a space that will dictate how I show the work. Like I think I look at myself like, like Robert Irwin. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to artists. I love how they think. I love how they talk. So I pull from all those histories to create my own history. So like, I want to sit in the space, see it. And then the space will tell me what it should be, you know, and you told me what it should be with, with the vinyl. I didn't, I never even considered it, you know? So like, that's what I mean. Like this, the exhibition itself, comes way later. I think I have to have the right content, the right language for the content to then do anything else um, for the most part. And I do see myself as, as an artist who will be making books first forever. And then the show will come, I think, after I make a bundle of things. And then the paintings themselves, they've never been shown. I'm gonna chop some up next week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull a ball of sorry and just destroy a bunch of stuff. And then I'm gonna restart over, <laughs> um, just because I, I feel bored by it, and I'm like, I don't want to show something I feel bored by. And also, the you know, the vinyl has like really shown me some things that I'm like, oh, I didn't consider. So I think I had to go think harder about what I'm doing before showing it. Especially, you know, if we're gonna play in the world of everyone else who's in the sandbox, 
and I want to be, you know, again, I want to be rigorous. I want to be thoughtful of all the history that is around us, present and past, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And okay, so about the on my side, the book, um, I think that you know we're we have we we have a relationship, so we talk often. And I knew that what Frank was making uh, because he was showing me some of the work, and I really loved, I I love them. I mean, they're just so they are simplistic. They're kind of um, like he said, minimal, um, and photographically minimal is interesting to me, especially when it has context to like. Uh, real life and problems, especially here in America. So, you know, there, it, I think it's very easy to make, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but I think it's fairly simple to make a uh, kind of um, work that means nothing and really difficult to make work that means something. Um, so when I saw it, I was like, and I know that Frank loves the book form and it probably has, I mean, he has a large library of books and he is always researching and I just, I love the work and I wanted to make it. So I think that at some point, I think we just talked about like, let's figure out how to make it. Uh, for for our company, um, we don't ask artists for money to make books. Um, so we we find pre-orders. I mean, that's how we make the books. We make books through like, you know, people pre-ordering the book as well as maybe having like two or three prints available for people to buy with the book. And that was great. I mean, it was super successful. I mean, we, we made enough money to make that book within, I think, a month, which is excellent. It doesn't always happen that way. And it wasn't a very expensive book, but also Frank wanted something that looked good, was heavily designed or not heavily designed, but like designed well, but didn't need like a, you know, a super huge hardcover book or anything like that that costs a fortune. Um, the soft cover allowed us to go bigger for less expensive. So that was that was a helpful. That was nice. Um and it's, it becomes a big size. It's like nine and a half by 11 and a half. And you can get, fit a really big image in there, really great looking spreads. And, you know, we we use the best papers in the world. So the books is always going to look good, you know. So yeah. for us, it was a it was an easy, easy game for me, like work with great artists that make great work and you'll make a great book easy. Like if I, you know, on my end, it's like trying to find a few museums that want to buy it so that we can build the artist career in that way. And if I can do that, then... You know, that's kind of like, that's all. Yeah. You know I mean? and, and Chris, I just, I see, I see a question here. I My first book is published by Chris. Chris is, I'm going to say this, Chris. I, Chris is the most influential Black publisher in America. And I think that everyone should own one of his books, for sure. And I think that I will always, Thanks, Frank. no, I know I will always be a supporter of you and make books with you and continue that in the future even when we do things with other people i'm like gotta go back home to do it <laughs> you know what i mean it's, it's, you know yeah, so I think we'll always that, we'll always be making some stuff i think that yeah. that's part of the game yeah you said there was a question let me see yeah I'm, yeah suki asked that question about do i self-publish and no wow. you know I, I, I can't say i self-publish you know yeah frank has been published probably by <laughs> a countless amount of people in the last two years, meaning like me on the art side, but many people on the, um, the like, you know, the magazine world. I mean, yeah. can you even count the amount of magazines you've been in the last two years? Do you keep a list? I keep a list, but I try to forget about it because I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to get hung up on what I've done. I want to get hung up on where I'm going. Like, I'm like, I'm hungry. I'm like starving. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because, so I'm like, I'm like, yo, where's the food? You know, like to me, what I've done in the past, I think it's, it only informs what I'm about to do. You know, like, I think that's how I think about it. And I think that too many people in our world of creativity thinks that because I make commercial work, that it is not viable in the fine art world. And I'm like, I'm here to say, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to say, I'm going to prove that, you know, over the lifetime of me making work. I don't. I think it's too early to tell right now, but I think in forty years there'll be a different conversation. You know, I don't think it's going to take forty years, but yeah, in my head it it, it will. You know, <laughs> yeah. you Yang asked, "What's next? Are you working Listen, on any new projects?" Yes, I'm always working on new projects. Um, I'm working on a new book with a friend of mine. It's it's a design forward book, but like 
it's an exploration of sheer photography, but I'm getting to explore one person's home over a length of time through their lens, through my lens, through our whole entire team's lens. Cause I don't make work alone anymore. Like I'm a staunch collaborator at this point. I couldn't do what I do alone. I'm not a lone wolf. And I think that like so many artists think that way. And I, I, I don't think that way. I, I need a team. I love a team. So what's next for me is just more collaborating, mm -hmm. you know, for sure, more collaborating. And then when I amass enough work to be able to write a theory about it, then I'll probably publish something else. But I have to make work, then I'll create a theory around it. Like I'm sort of like somewhat project-based thinking, but not really. Yeah, I mean, you can think of the idea of something and then try to make it for like make it come into fruition, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, you, I mean, I don't think any artist can truly say that I'm going to do this thing and then it becomes that thing. You know what I mean? I, I mean, mean, it's not like a good, not like a great artist. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, there's going to be some like hiccups and, yeah, you know, you're going to have to make some changes that didn't work and you're supposed to fail. So you know, that, that's how it goes. You know, we got to oh, fail. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love failing though, man. Great lessons always. I love it. I mean, I think from a commercial standpoint, what failures look like, I don't know if other people see it. I see it in my head. I'm like, you know, I see that I left something in the image, you know, mm -hmm. or like I leave a location. I'm like, dude, I missed that room, you know, or something like that, you know, or I missed that detail in the floor, in the shadows, you know, as I walk past it. I'm like, where's the camera? It always happens. I mean, on jobs, it's a little hard to get everything. I mean, no matter what. I remember being on the road photographing in Richmond, and I was like, I don't want to go out to 20 minutes away and photograph this school that was named after like Lee Davis, like Lee Davis High School. It had both their names on it, right? And I'm like, ah, I've been I've been here for eight days. I'm tired. I just want to go home. It's the middle of COVID. You know, like I, I feel like I'm gonna die. So. Yeah. Um, I did not shoot that. And then two months later, I went back and it was, the name was gone. Just like taken right off the building. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, man. So how do you feel about that? What do you mean? Is it a missed opportunity for you? No, I photographed the building with like this empty ass name on the top. It's great. I love that. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. See, the, the double the back. Yeah. yeah. That's good. No, I got you, Hey, look, you got to do what you got to do, right? I mean, sometimes you <laughs> miss something you want, but you get something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah we hit an hour man that's an like, hour, is, is one, an hour? Minute, one minute to an hour we nice. have another question from kimberly do you write much to accompany your work i do write i keep a little little google drive document i don't think i'm a great writer i think i i emote well but i don't think i have the language to carry it through in a book so that's why I love other people writing with me or for the work. Because I do think it's important to have a viewer's point of view on what I'm doing. Although they don't, they won't influence what I'm doing, but I like to hear their opinion. To influence what I'm doing is very difficult if it's my personal work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I mean, really, thank you for hanging out for an hour. I don't, and if you're on the East Coast, thank you so much. It's 10 o'clock. You know. <laughs> yeah, thanks for staying up late, both of y'all. Um, thanks, Chris, for joining us for this conversation and Frank for inviting Chris. This was wonderful. And thank you all for your great questions um, and for participating and listening tonight.